Check one, two. Check one, two. We're ready. Check one, two. Check one, two. Almost ready. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday night. Wednesday night church. Can't believe it. It's going to be awesome. Looking forward to it. The sun's dipping down. It's going to be getting colder and colder. Mr. Oscar is prepared. Excellent. Awesome, you guys. Hey, well, um, thank you for joining us this evening. Can't wait to get into God's Word. Remember, on Wednesday nights, we're trying a new format. We're going to be in God's Word first. And then we're going to end with worship and allow the Holy Spirit to move in a sweet way. Uh, doing the teaching first allows you to check your kids in a little bit easier. So that's going on right now. And then secondly, it allows us to not be so rushed during the worship time. And if you remember from last week, who was here last week? Raise your hand if you were here last Wednesday. Yeah, awesome. The reason I feel like, Ryan, you didn't really want to confess that you were here last week. I felt like it was like, you were like, I don't want to let people know. Okay, 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 there, there it is, there it is. Um, remember last week, we really, one of the refrains repeated in Revelation, uh, the letters to the churches, is he, um, let him who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. And so at the end of our time together, as worship is going on, if during the message, during this evening, or even, you know, maybe the Lord's spoken to you this morning or this day or the past week, the God's spoken to you in regarding to this message. We'd love to hear it. So come find me up at the front or Pastor Lars as well. We'd love to just kind of hear the burden the Lord's given you and maybe it's appropriate to share with the body. So the worship team is prepared to kind of tune out and allow someone to share. Last week it was so fun. Susan Ryder shared and Mike and uh, Wes and Becky Cohen shared. It was really sweet. So I want to encourage you if the Lord's moving in your heart and uh, giving you a word, we want to definitely hear uh, be bold, be courageous for that. Well, listen, uh, I wanted to give Lars just a quick moment. I don't see Lars. Lars is here today. He's here this evening. Is Pastor Lars anywhere? No? Do you see him anywhere? Was he over there? Lars. Pastor Lars! I wanted him to just share because I know you guys have all been praying for him and praying for their family and for Lindy, and I wanted him to give you guys an update. 
And then uh, as, uh, as he's coming out, that's awesome. As he's coming out, you can look to your left. Reality Santa Barbara, they meet on Sunday afternoons, and they're going through the book of Revelation also. And they're letting us borrow their little uh, poster over there. It's a timeline of Revelation, really cool. So be sure to check that out over there. Uh, really fun, fun fact. And then, you know, one thing I didn't mention last week that's going to be unique about our Wednesday nights is I didn't want just my voice to be heard on a Wednesday night. So we're going to be having guest speakers. And I can't wait to introduce you to the guest tonight. But please, here's Lars Lee. I want you just to share. The people have been praying for you. They'd love to hear what's going on. Hi, everyone. Hey, thank you so much. Um, we're totally exhausted, but uh, but the Lord is so good. He brought Lindy home today, and uh, we are so excited about that. And um, one of the things I just wanted to share is that uh, when on Sunday morning, uh, I was lis listening to the message online. I was with Lindy, and we we're going through especially hard time. She was uh, getting a blood draw at that point, which was very difficult on her. And I wasn't able to see the morning announcements or the worship at the, at the beginning, but I was able to catch the, uh, Nate's message uh, at the end. Well, Lindy actually, at the end of the message, and, and, and during that time, let me just, I'll just say this, the peace of God just surrounded me in that moment where we were with Lindy in a very difficult kind of time. And uh, Lindy actually scrubbed the video back, and I see Aaron Austin up there on the stage, or right here, and I was like, what's Aaron Austin doing there? He wasn't supposed to be a part of this service. And uh, I was like, is he doing announcements or something? And then I saw that he was praying for our family, and it was right at that moment, I believe, that the Lord really gave me peace when I was going through a difficult time, especially with Lindy. So I just want to remind, it just reminded me, and I want to remind you that sometimes God answers prayer right in the moment in just a, such a powerful way. And I believe the reason that we have our home right now is because our church prayed and uh, your love and your care uh, just was a fragrant aroma to God and he answered in such a way that is such, so powerful in our lives. So um, nothing that we definitely wanted to go through, but I believe that the Lord just got greater glory through it and I am thankful for that. So thanks again for praying and uh, really appreciate that. And uh, I'm sure my, my wife would be crying up here if she was talking to you, and she appreciates it as well. So thank you. Oh, man. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Lars. Amen. Thank you. Uh, know or don't know. You might know him from his previous uh, moment up on the platform with him and his uh, daughter were singing the Ranger Rhett song. But I want to invite Jesse Newton up to the platform this evening. So pumped. Um, Jesse is a man I've known for a long time. I actually went to Chicago with him on a Harvest Crusade event. That was incredible. Uh, Jesse spoke at a men's uh, morning a few months back. I was like, you know what? I'd love to have Jesse share with, with the church tonight. So um, unbeknownst to us with going regarding Lars, Lars is supposed to speak tonight. But last week, Jesse just said, hey, I don't even know why you asked Lars. But hey, you want me to speak for you next week? And uh, in you know, they switched, and lo and behold, you know, all this ordeal was happening. So, Jesse, looking forward to hearing what God's going to speak through you tonight. Thanks, Brother Nate. You got it, buddy. I'm, I'm, I'm almost as tall as him, right, guys? I mean, I'm, I'm close. I'm close. I awesome. think you're tall, yeah. All right. Awesome. Jesse! All right. Well, welcome, everyone, tonight. Um, as Nate mentioned, we're doing it a little bit different than Sunday mornings, where we uh, get excited with some some worship and then, and then get into the Word. Um, I'm going to try to to uh, get, get us uh, ramped up and excited uh, through some preaching. So um, there will be some, some audience participation as well. So if I ask any questions, don't be shy. And uh, um, yeah, yell it out. So uh, uh, as Nate mentioned, last week we covered, uh, we're, we're going through the seven letters to the seven churches. And uh, John wrote these letters in the uh, first century um, to real people uh, with real questions, real issues, um, in, in, a, in a real time and place. And last week we looked at Ephesus, and uh, uh, Jesus is actually the one uh, writing these letters to the different churches. Um, and uh, what Jesus has to say to the church in Ephesus, if you remember, was they were that church that was doing pretty much everything right. They, they had uh, endurance. They were not growing weary. They were testing uh, people who, who were coming in, uh, asserting authority and, and teaching, and were actually false apostles. And um, yet Jesus has one thing against them. Do you guys remember what it was? It was they had left their uh, first love, uh, which is, of course, Jesus. And um, the message from last week was, was hey, have, have we neglected uh, the passion and the love that we 
had for the Lord uh, when we first uh, started walking with him. I don't know if you guys remember that. I remember when uh, I was raised in the church, but I, I came back to the Lord, and that fire and that just desire to be with him was, uh, was so all-consuming. All uh, I just I look back on that and think, yeah, how do, how do we recreate that? And uh, it's very similar to marriage. I've been married to my wife, uh, Laura, for, for seven years, and um, wondering how do we keep things fresh? How do we make sure we're not just uh, uh, going through the motions? And so um, and it's interesting, there's actually no city currently in modern-day Ephesus. And Jesus' uh, exhortation to them was, if you don't come back to your first love and repent, uh, I'm going to remove your lampstand. And I wonder if uh, that is uh, Jesus' words uh, coming true there, if they, if they did repent or didn't. But um, it's in- interesting. But this week we're looking at Smyrna. Uh, Smyrna is the second letter, uh, the, the, the church that the second letter uh, was, was written to. And it's interesting, it's still a thriving city to this day. Um, it's in modern-day Turkey. Actually, all the churches, uh, the, the different cities where the churches were at uh, in, in, that these letters were being written to are, are in Turkey today. Um, and does anyone know the name of the, the city today, what it's, what it's currently called? Yes. Izmir. And um, uh, yeah, still a thriving tur- uh, or a city. It's a beautiful city. Um, and it's got an interesting history, which we'll see uh, based on Jesus' words. Actually, Jesus ties in some of the themes uh, that the city is kind of proud of, um, mainly that it was a city that was reborn. Um, it was a city that was, was dead and, and came back to life. So it was one of the finest seaports in the world. Um, and it was the closest seaport to Athens, uh, which was kind of the gateway to the west. Um, this is uh, in Turkey, so Asia Minor, so kind of the gateway to the east. And, and it had this bustling uh, economy. Um, it was also, interestingly enough, very close to the island of Patmos, which is where John is when he's seeing this vision of Jesus. Just The, the island is right off the coast of, of where... Uh, where uh, uh, Ephesus and uh, Smyrna are. Um, and so it's interesting, too, the, the order of these letters, the seven letters, uh, are on this kind of postal route that goes from, um, really, from uh, the coast from where John is on the island of Patmos, kind of inland, and it's these seven churches along that, that postal route. And so the first first uh, stop on the postal route is, is uh, Ephesus, and uh, the next one was, was Smyrna, and then next week uh, it goes to the next one. So, um, and, uh, uh, so there are three views of these letters. We're talking kind of high level before we talk about the letter itself. Um, these letters uh, could be seen as being written to, number one, specific churches in that time, right? We need to learn what was Jesus saying to those real people in that time period. Uh, the second view could be that it was... Uh, these are letters to different types of churches uh, throughout history um, that we'll see tonight. Smyrna is the persecuted church, the church that uh, really doesn't have anything uh, as far as wealth and, and possessions. Uh, but as Jesus will say, they really have everything because they have him. Um, and that there's, you know, there's always going to be a church that uh, has, has forsaken their first love, right? And that these are kind of these archetypes of, of different churches. Um, and then a third way you could look at these letters is that it was a sequential way of um, Jesus speaking to what, what was going to happen over time with the church. The first church in Ephesus uh, was the church right after Jesus ascended. And you have John and, and all the apostles. Ephesus was kind of the main hub of the early church. Uh, but then due to persecution, the hub kind of shifts and, and moves to Smyrna next in chronological order. Um, so it's interesting, uh, as you guys think about that, and as I've been thinking about it, that really all of these could be true and, and are true, right? It's that there's a sequential side of it. There's the kind of um, the, all, all the different types of churches that we see even in, in America today. Uh, you know, the, the very successful church, though, that has kind of forgotten Jesus. And, and then the church uh, that we know uh, in the world today that, that is the persecuted church, um, so, uh, yeah, so let's look at a little bit of the history of Smyrna, and then we're going to go into uh, the letter. So the, uh, the history of Smyrna, uh, which ties in again to their theme of, of death and rebirth, is um, that in 600 B.C., there, there was a thriving city there. Uh, but the Lydian king, Attalus, came in and conquered the, the city and left it in ruins. It was just a small village after his, uh, his uh, attack and uh, was really kind of nothing. Um, but then Alexander the Great came along, uh, one of the greatest conquerors in human history. 
um, and came through and he had a dream, uh, apparently, to rebuild the city and rebuild it to an even greater glory. And so he did. He rebuilt it, and, and that's where the folklore of the city, they were pr- uh, proud of uh, their, their city that was, was once dead and, and came to life. So Jesus uses this theme, death and rebirth, uh, and, and that's what's so cool as we study these letters is we're looking at uh, these, these letters from Jesus to these specific churches. He knows them so intimately, and he touches on themes that, that would be very real to them and know that, um, uh, that he sees them specifically, not just generally. Um, interestingly enough, too, uh, Smyrna, uh, the, the word Smyrna has, has a, a part in it that relates to one of their main things they were known for, which was myrrh. Uh, myrrh being the fragrant spice that was used uh, in embalming and um, uh, in, uh, the Egyptians used it. Um, Smyrna had the exclusive import and export rights to this very valuable uh, uh, spice. And so even the name Smyrna and Izmir today has that, carries that, uh, that, that name. Um, and so you can, you can even see how Jesus loves that and is going to touch on that when he talks about um, that, that they will be preserved kind of through, through death into, uh, into eternity. Um, so uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, open up to Revelation chapter 2. We're in verses 8 through 11, and uh, I'll read it now. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say they are Jews, but are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. So uh, my first question to you, we're going to go kind of verse by verse through here, but uh, again, who is writing this letter? You can just shout it out. I'm glad you didn't say John, because John was writing the letter, but, but it's, it's, John is really being dictated too. It's like he's, he's got the guy with the pen, and, and Jesus is saying, write this down, and he, he's writing it. And when I hear that, I think of the spiritual gift of prophecy. Uh, prophecy can be defined as just simply God speaking through a man, uh, a human. Um, in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, uh, the Bible says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. Um, but it's not just God speaking through, uh, through people, it's actually God-led. It's, these people aren't just doing it kind of of their own accord. Second uh, Peter one twenty one for prophecy never came by the will of man but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Um, so when John is is writing these down, do we think that he is using uh, this this kind of God said as a uh, just a, an emph- a way to emphasize what he's saying, just kind of make his his uh, his letter more powerful? Right? He knew these different churches from from personal experience. He lived in that area. He lived in Ephesus, which was a short. Uh, uh, a few miles from um, Smyrna. Is this just him kind of giving him an extra encouragement, an extra icing on the cake? Um, my wife and I went to Westmont, and I was thinking this is kind of like, you know, you're in the dining hall, and, and you come up, and the guy, you know, talks to the girl and looks her in the eye, and she's kind of eating with her friends. She's like, wait, what? And, and he's like, God told me that you are my future wife. <laughs> and she's kind of like, um, no. I don't even know you, you know. And, and my wife, as I was preparing this, my wife said, it could be that that really happened. And I said, yes, but there's a few desperate guys out there that, that like to put a little, little icing on the cake, you know. And, uh, and no, this is, not, this is not John trying to just, you know, put a little extra shot in the arm with, with this message. This is him just being uh, humbled and surrendered and just passing on pure truth uh, initiated by and, and, and spoken by God. Um, and so this just makes me think of prophecy. This makes me think of the two theories of, uh, or the two philosophies of, of prophecy. Uh, one is that it, uh, the continuationist theory that, uh, yes, prophecy was active in, in John's life, but it's still available to us today. And then there's the cessationist theory of, uh, uh, that it was, it was, yes, it was used. Jesus, of course, prophesied and, and, uh, and his apostles did, and there was kind of this purpose there. And then, 
that gift died as long as, uh, as well as a number of other spiritual gifts. And so I'm just wondering, what camp are you in uh, tonight? Uh, are you in the camp that, that prophecy is still a gift uh, that, that you can walk in, that you can um, make yourself available to God uh, uh, to? Uh, or is this something that, that really is, is foreign to us? And uh, my hope is that we would uh, take to heart the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. Uh, where he says, pursue love, yet earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. So my encouragement to us is that I believe the gifts are, of prophecy and, and other spiritual gifts are still available to us today. Um, but we have to be qualified. We have to be ready to be used. We have to be a vessel that is, is ready for God to use. And so I was thinking of what, what are those qualifications um, that, that John had, uh, but that we need to have if we want to be used by God. Um, I'm thinking salvation, right, that we, we have repented and, and put our trust in him. Um, just a hunger, uh, uh, Paul says, you know, earnestly desire these things. We're not just kind of going, uh, uh, you know, lukewarm through life, but we're, we're passionate. Um, and then the third thing is just holiness, is, is pure obedience, um, that, that uh, the holy men of God spoke as they were moved by God. Um, so I'm just thinking, you know, the, uh, John was, was pure in heart, right? He, he uh, had, had purified himself. He had walked with Jesus. And now at this stage in his life, he had been a leader in the church, um, holding to that, uh, the truth and the doctrines that he had received from Jesus directly. Um, but I'm thinking, you know, in our lives, are we also prepared? Do we have a pure heart and, and holiness? Or do we have sin getting in the way? So my hope tonight is just to, to ask you um, to now, and, and especially during the worship time, um, if there is anything that you know that is, is uh, making you, is, is getting in the way of, of holiness and of a relationship with God, um, that you would repent of it and just simply focus on Jesus again. Um, ask that he would use you, and, and, um, and he will. So um, moving on, uh, the next part is uh, the, the, the letter was written to the angel of the church uh, in Smyrna. And uh, when you think of, of the angel, uh, you can think of a, a heavenly being, a, a, a spiritual uh, a being, like a, an angel that we would think about um, in heaven. Or it's really the word angel means messenger. So it could be kind of the messenger from the church to John, uh, maybe the person who would receive the letter, maybe the pastor. Uh, we know from church history that the pastor in Smyrna uh, was a man named Polycarp. Polycarp was one of the uh, early church leaders and was uh, a famous uh, martyr as well. Um, he lived to be over 100 and, and was eventually killed for, for his faith. But he had uh, kind of received the mantle from John, again in Ephesus, um, when, and then John eventually dies. Um, Polycarp was kind of the successor to John in a lot of ways. So it's interesting to think that, again, chronologically, we, we went from Ephesus to now uh, Smyrna, um, that this letter was written to a, a real man and a real church. Who His job was to then take it and, and, and implement it and, and share it with the church and, and, uh, and, and live it out. Um, so uh, let's look at what Jesus says to this church. Uh, he calls himself the first and the last who died and came back to life. Again, this is that theme of rebirth uh, where... Uh, Jesus has taken something that's dead and, and brought it back to life. And, and we as believers, we believe that when we die, we will have rebirth. But I just want to ask as well, what are those, those maybe smaller areas, but still important areas in your life that Jesus has given you new life in? Maybe a relationship, maybe your marriage, uh, maybe just a, a joy in serving others and, and living out uh, what God's called you to do. Um, something that before Christ came into your life was, was dead. Um, I just know for myself, those things are so important, um, those testimonies uh, to myself and to others of, of the reality of God's uh, resurrection work. Um, so let's remember those. Uh, chapter 9, Jesus says, I know your tribulation and your poverty. Uh, this is just a powerful statement, again, because this is not just John writing, this is Jesus saying, I know. And I believe there are people here tonight who need to believe this, that Jesus knows. He knows what you're going through. He knows the thoughts you're having. He knows the, the tough situation you're in, maybe. And he knows. And what's interesting is there are different responses to that statement that Jesus knows. There's the response that's positive, which is gratitude and humility that the God of all creation, who created all of this, who created each of us, knows us intimately and the big and the little things in our lives and that he's with us. But there's also the not-so-great side of Jesus knows. If we're in sin, 
it's just that reminder that nothing we do is, is uh, outside of, of his view that, that he sees. Uh, but we need to remember that, that Jesus knows. And, and the church needed to hear that from Jesus because, as we'll see, they're feeling very alone. They're feeling very uh, forgotten um, because they were so poor and so oppressed. Um, so maybe you've given up uh, on God. You've believed that he doesn't see and Jesus calls us to be faithful and persistent in prayer, that when we pray in the quiet place, when we uh, call out to him, that he sees us and that he hears us. Um, sorry. <laughs> so uh, now we're getting into the meat of the letter. The people in Smyrna are experiencing three things. They're experiencing tribulation, which is pressure. Um, the word there was literally uh, a torture device where the, the person would lay on their back and they would put heavy stones on top of their chest until they couldn't breathe anymore. Um, that's ex essentially was, what was happening to the church. Everything that could be going well and, and make life easy and comfortable for them was, was going the opposite way uh, because of their faith in Jesus. Um, their poverty was, it was a result of that. It wasn't just that they, didn't, they were middle class. It was they were dirt poor. They had nothing. They uh, were excluded from even the basic uh, uh, opportunities that were afforded uh, everyone else in the city. Um, and then slander, which is um, just insult to injury, right? It's uh, attacking their character. It's kicking them while they're down. These uh, poor Christians are, are also being um, just uh, ha ha having false things said about them. Um, so uh, let's, let's talk more about Smyrna. What, what was this culture that they lived in? Uh, Smyrna was a city of emperor, a center of emperor worship, uh, meaning Caesar, because it was in the Roman Empire. And uh, yet the Jews had an exemption from saying that Caesar was Lord. Um, so Christians came out of Judaism. Um, Jesus, you know, is Jewish, and uh, the, the Christians were kind of lumped into uh, uh, J Judaism for that that early time. Uh, but what we're seeing is that the uh, the Christians they did not. Uh, they, they did not want to burn incense to Caesar, and they would actually get a certificate once a year um, that, that they burned incense, and that would give them the, the ability to, to buy and sell and do other things. Um, and what, what happened was the Christians were lumped in with the Jews, but the Jews basically distanced themselves from uh, the followers of the way at that, at that time, uh, which would other, they would otherwise be part of the synagogue, and they'd be exempt from that, that requirement. And so the slander was this. So here's what the Jews would say. Christians, they had these love feasts, and the Jews would say there was more going on than, you know, what should be done uh, in, a, in a love feast, right? And this was all, again, slander. Um, they said that Christians ate the blood and flesh of other people, right? They took communion together. Um, and the Christians also called their, uh, their, brothers, their, their brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, brother and sister, and um, the, the Jews said, hey, Romans, isn't that... Isn't that against the family? They're just saying anyone's their brother. You know, this is, it's, it's destroying the family. And the family was very important for Rome. Um, and so my question is, what is said about Christians today? Let's say in America. Let's say in, in Santa Barbara. Um, I'm thinking, you know, the words intolerant, bigoted, um, you know, backwards, whatever. That is what is being said about us uh, for our beliefs. And then uh, what are we expected to do to be accepted by our culture? Um, the, the people in Smyrna, the, the believers there, uh, had to kind of surrender and, and worship Caesar or be excluded. And I'm thinking of just the, the societal pressures of just falling in line with what is expected of us and uh, the, the consequences if we don't. And so uh, uh, I just want to encourage us that... Uh, in James 1.23, James writes, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let your endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Um, the, the church in Smyrna was very poor, but uh, because of this testing, they had perfection. They had complete riches. And I'm sure that they looked at the wealth of their neighbors um, and just the possibility of having an easier life. And they, they thought, man, we're poor. And that's why I love how Jesus says in, uh, in that verse that, you know, you, I know your poverty, in parentheses, but you are rich. He's encouraging them that they are actually richer than their neighbors. 
Um, and that's an encouragement to each of us. Uh, I know many here uh, in Santa Barbara, we, we have a lot of wealth, uh, but there's always someone with more, right? We can always look at uh, the bigger house or the whatever. And, and uh, for someone like myself, this is just amazing encouragement that even if I lost everything, I'm still rich because of Christ and only because of Christ. Um, so I just have a question by a show of hands. Has anyone here been um, harshly persecuted because of their faith? The mic? Yeah, I, I haven't really. And that's why it's hard for me to relate to these believers in Smyrna. Um, I, I've been minorly inconvenienced at times. I've had hard things happen because of, uh, but, but I'm not, I, I don't even know how to really relate to these believers. Um, and so Jesus here in verse 10 says, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. And I just think death in Santa Barbara, it's, it's a far off from a lot of our minds. Life is so enjoyable here. Death is avoided and even discomfort is avoided. I think of the, this COVID time and it's been very impactful to me. Um, and people have lost jobs and, and even loved ones have died. Um, but I've been so frustrated with just the limited options that we have. Oh, I can only go to the beach or I can go on a bike ride with my kids. Like that's all I can do after work. I'm so frustrated. And the believers in Smyrna, they didn't enjoy any of those things. They didn't have enough food to eat. And while they're struggling to find food, they're still a target of, of oppression. And Jesus reminds them, you're going to be thrown in, in jail, um, some of you, for 10 days, which was just a kind of a, 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 a phrase that meant kind of a, a short period of time uh, back in that time. And he says, but, this is the common theme we'll see throughout all of Jesus' teachings, right, is if you hang in there, if you endure till the end, uh, I will give you the crown of life. Um, I just wonder if our, in our lifetime any of us uh, tonight will face death for Jesus. Um, or if we'll just experience greater and greater persecution as the true divisions come up uh, between people who are called by Jesus' name and people who are living uh, for themselves and held to a different standard. Um, so my prayer is that we would take a lesson from the church in Smyrna. We would sacrifice our wealth, our possessions, and our comfort, and even our lives uh, in humble and faithful sacrifice to Jesus, believing that his words uh, to, at the end of this letter are true. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. I know I'm afraid that the first death is going to hurt, but the second death will be a transformation uh, into who we will be for eternity, and uh, we'll be with Jesus forever. So, um, yeah, bow your heads with me. Let's pray. Jesus, uh, I'm so thankful for uh, your message that um, we have in our hands today. Um, God, this, uh, this glimpse into... Uh, your words to this this real group of people in, in this real place. And um, God, we don't know, most of us, what it's like to experience hunger and fear and uh, the fear of death for ourselves and our loved ones because of you. Um, but we believe that we can can take a lesson from from this church and remember, God, that, uh, that this life is not all there is, that um, to be with you is is better than even being here. Um, and yet we have, you have work for us to do here. So help us to be uh, holy vessels who are prepared for the work that you have for us. Um, I pray for each person here tonight, God, that you would bless them, that you'd meet them right now, and that they would be able to confess any sin in their life. And um, we just thank, thank you, God, that you are good and that you uh, have eternity in your hands, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesse. What a great word, man. We appreciate it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Jesse. What a good word. Well, we're going to, the worship team is up. We're going to worship. Uh, you know, also, maybe you're here and you just would love to have, receive some prayer. Love to pray over you. We'll have some of our, our leaders, some servants over there on the picnic tables praying with you. And uh, again, we just, we have some time, you know, we, we have an opportunity just to allow the spirit to move and worship. Um, if the Lord's spoken something to your heart, we'd love to hear it. So come find me. I'm going to be standing over there. But um, I love what Jesse kind of talked about, just, you know, these things says the first and last who was dead and came to life. And maybe there's some things in your life that um, were once dead, and they've come to life. That's a reason to rejoice. It's a reason to worship. 
maybe currently, right now, there's some things, relationships, opportunities, dreams that seem dead, that seem dead. Maybe Jesus wants to breathe some life into those things. Love to pray over that. So let's just spend some time hearing from the Lord, worshiping. You're welcome to stand, to sit. We just want, we're not going to command anything out of you. You can allow the Spirit to move. But we'll worship. Prayer team will be over there. And if the Lord's speaking something, Lord's speaking something, stirring something up, we want to hear that. Come find me. Come, Pastor Lars.